today's lecture is going to deal with cardiovascular health. Before we really get into cardiovascular health, we need to take a brief introduction to the cardiovascular system. So the cardiovascular system is actually a subsystem of a true physiological system, which is the circulatory system. And the cardiovascular system deals with two principal organ sets. The cardio refers to the heart, and the vascular refers to the vessels carry the blood around the human. Now, when we refer to cardiovascular disease, we're actually referencing a group of diseases that affect heart and our vessels. And we're talking about cardiovascular disease today. It's important because this is actually the leading cause of death in the United States. The next lecture is going to deal with cancer. And the reason we're going to talk about cancer is because cancer is the second leading cause of death in the United States. Now, cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death, but what actually causes cardiovascular disease? The causes of cardiovascular disease to develop include sedentary behavior, physical inactivity. This is your number one uh, constituent component to cardiovascular disease. Second to sedentary behaviors is tobacco use, cigarette smoking, cigar tobacco, and other forms of tobacco. So tobacco use also is going to contribute. The third major cause is an individual's unfamiliarity with the signs and the risks for cardiovascular disease. So these three things, sedentary behavior, tobacco use, things like smoking, and then the unfamiliar familiarity with signs and the risks uh, are the three leading causes of cardiovascular disease development. So let's take a look at some of these risks and see if we can identify the risks above and beyond sedentary behavior and tobacco use. So what are the risk factors and what do risk factors actually indicate? In this figure here, you can see a variety of different risk factors. And you'll see smoking and physical act act inactivity are on here as well. But you're also going to see things like high blood cholesterol, obesity, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, age, gender, genetic factors, race, and ethnicity. You're also going to notice that some of the boxes are green and some of the boxes are red. The green boxes relate to modifiable risk factors. The red boxes relate to non-modifiable risk factors. And all of these uh, uh, risk factors can be used to predict one's probability for cardiovascular disease. So what are some of these terms mean? What does it mean to be a modifiable risk factor? A modifiable risk factor means it's a risk factor that we can adjust. So let me give you an example. We can stop smoking. We can increase our physical activity. We can take medications to reduce our blood pressure. We can modify and manage our diabetes. We can undergo weight loss for obesity, and we can take uh, drugs to help reduce our cholesterol. So all of these are modifiable risk factors. One of the most prevalent modifiable risk factor is a collection of risks that make up a condition called metabolic syndrome. And 
metabolic syndrome is a syndrome in which you have three or more of these modifiable risk factors. So three or more modifiable risk factors. So you can see abdominal obesity, triglyceride and HDL cholesterol, high blood pressure, fasting glucose, all of these risk factors with their different levels. If you exceed these levels, you are an individual with this thing called metabolic syndrome. And so it's really important to reduce metabolic syndrome by reducing these three or more modifiable risk factors. On the other side are the risk factors that are not modifiable. And these risk factors we cannot adjust. So we don't have the ability to change our gender or to change our age. We don't have the ability to modify these things. Now you can see that as we increase in age and then also have our differences in gender, male versus female, you can see that the risk or the number of new and reoccurring attacks, these are heart attacks, is actually going to increase. Neither of these gender or age are modifiable risk factors. These are both non-modifiable risk factors. And heart attack is closely associated with increases in age. You will also notice that there is a risk factor in both the lower areas here, 29 to 44, 45 to 64, there's a higher risk if you are male compared to female counterparts. After 65, that risk factor basically equalizes, and we're nearly equal between male and female after 65 years of age. Now, I said earlier that cardiovascular disease was a group of diseases that affects the heart and the vessels. So what are some of the major forms of this disease? One of the most common forms of cardiovascular disease, which actually leads towards development of other cardiovascular diseases that are far more deadly, is hypertension or high blood pressure. So hypertension or high blood pressure. Now, when you look at blood pressure, we measure blood pressure, and you may remember this from previous lectures. We me measure blood pressure in two ways, a systolic pressure and a diastolic pressure. Now, systolic pressure is going to occur during systole, which is during heart contraction. So the systolic pressure is the pressure experienced by the heart turn contraction. Diastole, or the diastolic pressure, is the pressure experienced by the heart during relaxation, the heart's relaxation. So think of systole as being when the heart is beating, and diastole is between the beats of the heart. And pressure jumps between the two. As the heart beats, pressure increases, and as the heart relaxes, pressure decreases. Now, hypertension is a pretty interesting disease condition because this particular disease process is associated with no symptoms. It's a symptomless disease. The only way that you can detect or determine this form of cardiovascular disease is through direct measurement of the blood pressure. And that's one of the reasons that every time you go to the doctor, they measure your blood pressure. It's because this is a symptomless disease. 
But even though it's symptomless, it's still a very dangerous disease because it places strain on the heart and on the vessels. And it's that strain from higher blood pressure that actually can lead towards a variety of other cardiovascular diseases, including our next cardiovascular disease, which is atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis is a condition in which things like high blood pressure impute damage to the vessel wall. Now, just like all of our other tissues, when we damage tissue, that tissue has to heal. When we damage a vessel wall, that repair process is actually going to potentially have some adverse effects. Now, not only is hypertension one of the leading causes of atherosclerosis, but smoking also is a leading cause as is a high concentration of low-density lipoproteins. Lipoproteins that carry cholesterol through the bloodstream. So these three risk factors increase the prevalence of atherosclerosis. And just like I've already mentioned, when we damage the tissue that lines our vessels, you can see that we get that damage. And then as that damage is repaired, we actually increase these fatty deposits on the surface of the vessel wall. And so these fatty deposits accumulate on the inner wall of the vessel. And there is a couple consequences of increasing the inner wall of the vessel or the accumulation of the fatty deposits. One of them is that we reduce the diameter of the vessel. And you can see that here in these two, uh, these two figures. The distance here is now greater than reduced, and this decreases the ability for blood to flow through the vessel. Now, in addition to the changes that we experience in the diameter, leading towards reductions in blood flow, There's some additional problems as well. That tissue weakens, and you can actually have the vessel wall completely rupture, causing internal bleeding into the surrounding tissue. The other thing, too, is we can have parts of the plaque or this fatty deposit break away, and they can lead towards an occlusion or a blocking of other vessels within the system. Now, if we block a vessel in our toe, yeah, you may lose the toe, but it's not uh, life-threatening with, with modern medical intervention. But what happens if the vessel that's blocked is one of those coronary arteries? These are the arteries that supply blood to the heart. Well, doing that, blocking a coronary artery can actually lead to a myocardial infarction, or what you would call a heart attack. These deposits can also break off and make their way into the cerebral circulation. This is going to be the circulation of the brain. And it can enter into the cerebral artery arteries and block those cerebral arteries and lead towards stroke. And so heart attack and stroke become very real concerns for highly progressed atherosclerosis. And we'll talk about uh, stroke in just a few minutes uh, as another uh, cardiovascular disease. But before we get there, I want to take a look at some of the diseases that are collectively known as heart disease, which is also going to include heart attack. But before we talk about heart attack, we can talk about coronary heart disease. Coronary heart disease, again, these are the arteries 
that supply blood to the heart, so the arteries of the heart. And what happens with coronary heart disease is we begin to see a hardening of the tissue. And that hardening leads, toward a re leads towards a reduced effectiveness to deliver blood. Now, as coronary heart disease progresses, and we have this reduced effectiveness to deliver blood, we begin to inadequately supply blood to a variety of tissues. If it's the heart tissue, this can lead to myocardial infarction. And an infarct is also known as a heart attack. And what happens during a myocardial infarction or a heart attack is we actually experience damage and even death to the heart tissue. And as we experience that damage or that death to the heart tissue, we begin to lose the ability for the heart to function. And that experience of death and damage to the heart tissue is caused by the reduced oxygen supply. The heart tissue demands a lot of oxygen. That oxygen comes from the blood, and as blood flow reduces, we reduce oxygen perfusion. Now, when you have a heart attack, you may experience some symptoms. Some of the symptoms of heart attack are going to include an angina pectoris, which is a fancy way of saying chest pain. So you may experience chest pain. You may experience arrhythmias or dysrhythmias. And an arrhythmia or a dysrhythmia is an alteration to the normal rhythmic contraction of the heart. So we lead to these irregularities in the heart's ability to contract. A third symptom that you may experience is a numbing or pain that radiates down your arm. One additional heart disease that an individual may experience is called sudden cardiac death. Sudden cardiac death, also known as a cardiac arrest, is a serious medical event that occurs not due to trauma, so it's a non-traumatic unexpected event in this cardiac arrest this is basically the heart stops beating is often due to an irregular heart or what we would call a arrhythmia or a dysrhythmia so those are some different types of heart disease. Um, we've already briefly mentioned stroke. A stroke is going to be a reduced or inhibited flow of blood to the brain. So we reduce or inhibit our blood supply to our brain. Now our brain is an energetically demanding tissue and when we reduce or inhibit blood supply we reduce oxygen oxygen and nutrient flow and, and waste removal and those things can lead towards damage even death to our brain cells so here you can see a picture of uh, the physiology that happens the pathophysiology of 
uh, two different types of stroke. And basically, what you will see is we have a situation where we're preventing or we're, or we're reducing blood flow. So two types. Basically, the net result is the same. A stroke is that reduced uh, or inhibited blood supply. The two different types, they just are differentiated by how blood supply is reduced. The first is called an ischemic stroke. An ischemic stroke is caused by reduced blood flow to the brain due to a blood clot. So we have a clot that blocks blood flow and prevents blood flow to certain cells within the brain. The other type is a hemorrhagic stroke. And a hemorrhagic stroke is going to occur when you have a ruptured blood vessel. So the blood vessel breaks, and rather than the blood flowing to the tissue, it flows out of the circulation into the surrounding area, and we're no longer providing an adequate blood supply to that tissue. One final cardiovascular disease that I'd like you to be aware of is a condition known as chronic heart failure. And chronic heart failure, or CHF, is this condition where the heart loses its ability to adequately pump blood away from the heart. So chronic heart failure is an inability of the heart to pump the blood that returns. So as this blood comes into the heart, we're unable to move that blood out of the heart. You can see that we begin to collect blood, especially in our ventricles and especially in our left ventricle. Here's a normal healthy heart. That blood comes in and it's excreted from the heart into the pulmonary circuit or into the general circuit very effectively. So we don't have this sort of buildup of heart that is not being pumped effectively out of the out of the heart. And what ends up happening is congestive heart failure or chronic heart failure uh, progresses as we have a backup of blood in the venous side of the circulation. And so we begin to have blood that can't make its way into the heart and it begins to pool or accumulate on the venous side of our circulation. And as we build up more and more blood on this venous side, it begins to inundate into our tissue. And we're not adequately removing uh, our waste products, not adequately supplying nutrients and uh, oxygen to, uh, to our tissues, and it becomes very, uh, very problematic for an individual. Fortunately, there are some strategies that you can implement now that will help you prevent the development of heart disease much later into life. One of the most important things that you can do is you can participate routinely in physical activity. Now, by participating in physical activity, a couple of the things that happen, you're well aware of them, but they have an effect on the prevalence of heart disease, the likelihood of heart disease. Physical activity will lead towards better weight and a healthier body weight. Will also lead towards improvements in your metabolic values. In this term metabolic values I'm using to describe things like your blood pressure. So reduction in blood pressure, reduction in cholesterol, the associated low density lipoproteins that help transport cholesterol in the bloodstream. It'll help to modify and manage your glucose levels. 
the other thing that you can do is to modify your diet and to focus your dietary intake on heart healthy foods. Now, one of the biggest regulators or uh, modifiers of blood pressure is salt. So a heart healthy diet is going to have a more limited salt intake. Now, I'm not saying just completely eliminate salt. You still actually are going to need the sodium and the chloride for other physiological functions, but you don't need to have large amounts of salt in your diet. Heart healthy diet also is going to have an increase in the non soluble fibers or the dietary fibers. It's also very important to eliminate alcohol use. And then the last thing that you can do if you are currently a smoker is to eliminate smoking. These are three very simple steps for most Americans that will lead towards a much better resistance towards cardiovascular disease, our leading cause of death in the United States.